in an extreme weather future. My name is Judy Gallagher, and I'm Senior Vice President of Federal Business Development for AECOM Technical Services in Arlington, Virginia. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping rules before we get started with our presenters. Uh, if you haven't already, please mute your phones. As we go through the presentation, if you think of any questions you'd like to ask the presenters, please submit those in the chat box anytime during the event, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end after the presentation itself. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode, and also this webinar will be recorded. Next slide. The mission of the SA Society of Mil American Military Engineers and the Environmental Committee is to enhance professionalism, create value for the civil service and military members, and provide true tra training and form for interchange ideas. The Environmental Committee seeks this mission through several avenues, including guest speakers on relevant topics during monthly conference calls, supporting conferences that promote environmental awareness and committee objectives, and special membership meetings at the annual SAME Joint Engineer Training Conference and Expo and SAME Small Business Conference to recruit new members and promote the Environmental Committee's mission. Next slide, please. Today, presenting our webinar, we have three speakers. Uh, Robert Krauss is practice lead for Grand Papes Disaster Management Recovery Services Program. Robert has 15 years of experience as an architectural and environmental historian in state and local government and has led CRM and historic survey reviews for disaster recovery programs in Texas, Florida, and South Carolina. A native of St. Petersburg, Florida, Robert earned his PhD in United States history from the University of Mississippi or Ole Miss in 2010. Our second speaker, Mason Miller, is a senior land and marine archaeologist with Austin-based Amaterra Environmental. He received his bachelor's in archaeology from the University of Texas at Austin and his master's degree in underwater archaeology from Texas A&M University, although he is an orange-blooded heart, which kind of hurts my feelings as an Aggie myself. Mr. Miller's field experience includes historic and prehistoric terrestrial projects and underwater investigations in the U.S., Central America, Portugal, and the Azores. Mason also serves as Amaterra's lead geophysical remote sensing specialist using magnetometers, ground penetrating radar, and other tools for non-invasive investigations. And our third speaker, Mickey Schmidt, is chief of the science and geospatial division for NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. The program initiatives in that division include leadership for the digital coast, data acquisition and delivery, and economics. An expert in applying geospatial technologies, Mickey has had a long career with the federal government. From 1988 to 1991, he served as a civilian remote sensing scientist for the U.S. Army Strategic Defense Command and then joined NASA's Commercial Remote Sensing Program, working with private industry to develop new remote sensing, remote sensing products and services. Next slide. Please. Four learning objectives for today's webinar. Understand the growing evidence of the effects of the change in climate today and see how facilities across the country are being affected. Understand the command's responsibilities in managing significant archaeological sites, historic buildings and districts, and sacred sites under federal law. Unlearn the current model that environmental risks influence of influences of today are the same environmental risks and influences of tomorrow. And to understand resources available to DOD personnel that they can use to improve resilience and accurately anticipate potential extreme weather related risks to cultural resources and address them proactively before for disaster when priorities may be elsewhere. Next slide.
Mal, can we get the next slide, please? There we go. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to our first speaker, Mr. Robert Krause. Robert? Hi, uh, thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, my name is Robert Krause. I'm, I work for Grand Pape here in Houston. I'm a practice lead for disaster management. I think I can speak for the other panelists when I say that we're very excited to present this material on a topic that is nationally, if not internationally significant, and also applicable to DOD communities and installations across the United States. So the goal today is to provide some background information, look at some current research, and provide potential outcomes using solutions-based perspectives on climate change in military and DOD installations. But before we get there, we should first define the problem before us. And that would be, how are extreme weather events impacting cultural and historic resources on your installation? So what do we know? We need to assess the risks, benefits, and costs. Um, first of all is that extreme weather events and natural disasters transcend geopolitical boundaries. Uh, they can touch anyone and anything really in any community. And we learned that here in Houston, City of Jacksonville learned that during Irma. Folks across California and the Intermountain West know all too well about wildfire, drought, and uh, most parts of the country have been subject to flooding in the past two decades. Extreme flooding that had never been seen before in precedent. Uh, next slide, please. Well, several bases across the country have been thrown into this challenge head first, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. But in a world full of uh, opportunities disguised as challenges, uh, the problem of climate change, natural disasters, and sea level rise has had and will continue to have a demonstrable impact on bases across the country. And this presents a challenge to national security in terms of facilities, but also to the layers of communities that a singular base, base exists within. And, you know, I think we can look directly to Tyndall Air Force Base as uh, an example of how climate change and extreme weather events are having that distinct impact on the cultural and physical landscape of the military. The third thing that I think we know that's established is that the responsibility for cultural resources on DOD installations includes the documentation and evaluation of buildings over 45 years of age as required by federal statute. We'll get into these in a little while, but NEPA, NHPA, Section 106 and 110 and that all important 45 year old, 45 year thro threshold cutoff date for what is considered historic, now 1975. And as we uh, creep towards the 1980s, this is increasingly important across the military installation landscape. And uh, what we're seeing is the inherent issues associated with both cultural and historic sites and natural disasters on bases are interconnected and they're part of the broader environmental management of those installations. And that's witnessed in a few reports uh, that have been released uh, within uh, DOD and Congress. Really, in the last five years, climate change is considered a threat to national security by DOD, the Pentagon, and the service branches themselves. And July 2015, many of you are probably familiar with the DOD memo to Congress stating that global climate change will aggravate problems like poverty, social tension, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership of weak political institutions that threaten stability in a number of countries. Uh, follow that up with January 2019 report released by the Pentagon to DOD, stating that climate change threatens most mission critical military bases, nearly all of which have some kind of historic building stock. And the, uh, the effects of a changing climate are really a national security uh, issue with potential impacts to DOD missions, operational plans, and installations. In that report, 79 installations were examined through the Army, Air Force, and Navy. Uh, <clears throat> that, that report found that 53 of those 79 faced current threats from flooding, and 43 of the 79 faced current threats from drought, and 36 of 79 faced current threats from wildfires. The Navy and the Marine Corps list all of their installations as threatened by coastal erosion and sea level rise including those iconic places like Camp Lejeune, Camp Pendleton. And that assessment didn't even look at massive storm damage to Tyndall Air Force Base uh, during, uh, and US, uh, the Marine Corps Camp Lejeune that you see in front of us right here, and, and flooding it off at Air Force Base. Those three events were not even included in that, uh, th that study. So you can see how, uh, and, and the last slide showed how Michael, Hurricane 
uh, Michael directly hit Tyndall Air Force Base and damaged more than 700 buildings, forced the relocation of 1,100 personnel, 11,000 personnel, 46 aircraft. And those rebuilding efforts were uh, estimated at more than 4.7 billion. Luckily, the Cultural Resource Group at Tyndall has been consistently active since the 80s, if not earlier. Uh, it's cultural resources st studies done in 1989, 94, and they've performed, uh, as other uh, bases have, environmental assessments of new combat arms range. Uh, and, and, but the $5 billion that the Air Force will need to help its, its buildings recover from and its bases recover from hurricane and flood damage just in 2019 alone uh, is staggering. And uh, in the next series, we'll get to why this is important and what, are we, uh, what we are doing. So hi there, everybody. I'm Mason Miller. I'm one of the senior archaeologists at Amatera Environmental that's based here in Austin. And I'm here to talk about what these cultural resources are. And, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about here and there um, what those are. And I'm just going to kind of go over the, the basics of uh, what are cultural resources and, and your role in the Department of Defense in managing and protecting those resources. So, um, Ultimately, cultural resources are us. They are the building blocks of the story of our history and our heritage. Uh, they are, as a country, as, a, as humanity itself, they can be archaeological sites, they can be individual archaeological artifacts, they could be cemeteries. They don't even have to be specific, they don't have to be specific objects or things. They could just be locations that are significant to certain groups. Those are called uh, traditional cultural properties. Typically, they're ceremonial sites of some kind. Uh, they don't have to be on the land or, or uh, they don't just have to be on the land. They could be in the water. There's even some talk of their cultural resources up on the moon that are being uh, discussed right now. And so essentially, they are um, anything that are parts of what makes us who we are now as uh, humans and as Americans and everything else are what these cultural resources are. And uh, ultimately as a soldier or as a sailor or an airman or, or something like that, you might be asking, you know, you might not even have much exposure or experience with cultural resources in general, but you are very much a part of this heritage and this history as a human being, but also as an American. Uh, in fact, many aspects of the American military history are also significant components of our cultural heritage and our history. In addition, you have a large number of people who aren't uh, in the military who uh, hold these cultural resources very, very dear. And your job in the, in the United States military is to protect those resources as well as a part of protecting these people as a whole. And then finally, uh, it's the law to manage and protect these resources. So, um, there are a couple of major laws that oversee uh, cultural resources uh, in general, and uh, the first one is Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which essentially mandates that any federal agency, anytime they take any kind of an action, whether it's a direct action that they take, or if they have some approval, or if they're issuing funds or something like that, then um, in a nutshell, what they have to do is they have to ask themselves, um, before I take whatever this action is, what will the result of that action be on significant cultural resources? And it's important to note that under Section 106, there isn't a prohibition on impacts to, to, to resources, uh, even significant ones. What it does is it does mandate that you have to ask the question and be prepared to manage the, re the results of that if there are significant resources through mitigation or maybe alternatives. Uh, any sorts of other uh, actions that can be taken to appropriately manage the resources that are there. Now, the other uh, important historic preservation and archaeological preservation law is Section 110 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And uh, this one provides more of a, uh, it's a, a more of a broad programmatic legal conservation and preservation initiative. And under Section 110, uh, every federal agency has a historic preservation program. There are uh, mandates to identify and inventory and manage the significant resources that are on uh, different uh, DOD and federal properties. And also that, um, and this is a particularly important one with regard to climate related impacts, is that there can't be any uh, demolition to these resources through neglect or um, 
inaction as a result of this. And so ultimately section 110 is kind of the, it's a, it's a conservation initiative um, to protect these sites because once they're gone, they're gone forever. And so it's your job uh, under section 110 to do that. So um, this is just sort of a, I'm not gonna go over all of these, but there are a range of environmental impacts that can happen on Department of Defense facilities that could have uh, impacts to cultural resources. And so some of them might be tied to specific actions that might be required, which would be triggers for section 106, but in others there might be uh, impacts to just broader management initiatives and efforts. And so in general, all of these different types of weather related impacts can have implications on cultural resources that need to be addressed through your uh, actions on military facilities. So, uh, you know, one thing that might come up in your head is, um, you know, floods and fires and hurricanes, yes, there, the, there might be an archeological site that gets destroyed or there might be a historic house that gets washed away in a hurricane. We don't have any way to control that. That's an act of God. And in many instances, that is the case that you cannot stop floodwaters from rising. You can't stop a forest fire from igniting and burning. But if there is information out there that tells you that you have a liability uh, for a historic resource or, or an archeological site that might be prone to erosion or flooding or fire or something like that, and you have not addressed those issues proactively and in advance of those problems, and then that problem happens, that is your responsibility. And so, um, and that's something that's specifically outlined in section 110. So an example of this might be if you have a, let's say a, a, a Native American cemetery that's on the, uh, the bank of a creek and there are many indicators that that creek is prone to, prone to flooding and potential erosion. And then lo and behold, there is a, a major rainstorm that comes through and washes out that creek bank and that cemetery is washed away that is your responsibility because there was enough information available to tell you that this was a liability that needed to be addressed beforehand. So, um, and in the past, it's worked pretty well that you can look backwards. You can try to find um, previous examples and see weather trends and different ways to manage these resources in accordance with the, the typical weather trends and patterns that are um, for a region. But this is an example where there's, the weather patterns are changing and as a result, you're gonna, there are new ways that people are having to address impacts to these resources. Now, this is not a Department of Defense facility. This is a National Historic Park, which is under the management of the National Park Service. This is the Tumakakari Kakori National Historic Park. I think every time I've done this, I've pronounced it differently. But anyway, this is a, 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 an early 19th century uh, Franciscan chapel that is made of adobe in Southern, um, Arizona. And back as early as the 1970s, there were records of, by the National Park Service that were concerned with groundwater infiltrating the adobe and soaking up through capillary action from below. Um, and there have done various things to address those uh, liabilities over time. But in the previous decades, there have been a larger number of intense rainfall episodes, much higher than anything they'd ever had before. And also coupled with it, those rainfalls are coming in periods of the year when it's not normal. And there's also been a, a greater deal of heat um, in this region in particular. And as a result, they're finding that water is infiltrating not from below, but from above, which all of their management and uh, protection measures that they've been taking uh, aren't really helping this matter. And so back in 2015, they had two major instances where uh, sections of the walls had eroded away, um, including this section here, like a ton of adobe fell off during a particularly intense rainstorm during the fall. Um, so you don't quite have as much information to work with to plan and predict where your culture, where your cultural resource impact liabilities might be from weather related impacts because looking backwards isn't necessarily gonna be quite as effective as it used to be. And there's been a prevailing, um, consistent, a, a growing consensus in various governmental agencies that they realize that as time goes on and as people are studying natural impacts and uh, climate impacts more closely and they're bringing to bear stronger and more powerful computer processing and modeling that this whole idea of people not knowing that this was a problem 
uh, early is going to be less and less of a defensible argument. And uh, as this happens, there's also going to be an increased uh, position that governments are liable, are liable for those impacts or evidence of impacts to significant cultural resources on Department of Defense facilities, for example, could be brought into lawsuits for outside agencies as well. And, you know, as to see this, I just ran a quick Google search trend search, and you actually can see over time that there is a, granted a, a slight increase, but still it is going up. Uh, of instances of people searching climate change and lawsuit at the same time. And so what this tells us is that people are starting to realize that there is a connection here and therefore there is a liability connection as well. And that could be uh, something that could be uh, of concern going forward. In addition, um, I think we saw from the Dakota Access Pipeline, our, all of the unrest and the protests and everything that went with that, that cultural resource impacts can be a a very strong catalyst for a lot of community unrest. And we all know that uh, the Department of Defense and all of these uh, facilities really rely on being very close and very positive members of their community. And in this instance, um, with the Dakota Access Pipeline, that pipeline, uh, according to many of the tribes in that region, was impacting several of those sacred sites, those traditional cultural properties. and. Uh, to a large degree, those impacts sparked all of these protests that um, we all read about on the news, and it's still being argued in the courts today. And so what I'm going to do now is sort of pass the baton back over to Robert so that he can talk a bit more about um, how do we take this information and move forward uh, on Department of Defense facilities. Thanks for that, Mason. And really, uh, Mason expressed this much more eloquent than I, eloquently than I could, but uh, you know, we're talking about iconic and historically significant places that are part of the nation's history. Uh, places that we'll talk about coming up like Offutt Air Force Base, home of the well-known Enola Gay. Uh, Camp, Camp Lejeune is probably known to every United States Marine across the world. And uh, Tyndall Air Force Base, of course, one of the oldest and most significant installations within the Air Force. Um, and much like climate change, you know, uh, impact to historic resources and cultural resources is a global issue. But here in the U.S., archaeologists estimate that climate change alone threatens 20,000 historic sites in the U.S. Uh, nearly 4,000 National Park Service assets are included in that, or, and it's valued at over $40 billion. They're highly vulnerable to erosion in coastal areas and elsewhere. Uh, so this loss of archaeological sites a global issue uh, in UNESCO in their study of coastal world heritage sites estimated that of 720 of those over 20 percent of them will be impacted by sustained sustained sea level rise currently taking place now closer to home I'm sure there are a few, a few folks out there at least in the Hampton Roads area in Virginia in 2017 a report by Scott Seibel who is an archaeologist at AECOM looked at how we can manage and mitigate the effects of climate change and sea level rise specifically on archaeological sites at Fort Eustis in Newport News, Virginia. Um, Seibel really outlines the threats, the sea level rise, increased tidal range, flooding from increased rainfall events, and more intensifying storm, storm surges. But the good news is, you know, DOD is already integrating climate-related impacts into its planning. And this assessment of risks, risks and influences and the challenges posed by, by climate change and sea level rise should increase awareness and develop solutions to most effectively deal with historic building stocks on your installations. And part of the impact of these new conditions really calls for a more vigilant overview of installation, cultural, and historic resources, and how the potential reuse or demolition of that resource impacts the base and service-wide mission. And the National Park Service and, Service and National Advisory Council for Preservation do much of the lifting in terms of evaluating impacts cultural and historic sites at DOD facilities. Uh, the potential for increased collaboration exists across DOD and Department of Interior lines and other, other agencies. Um, and I think what we've mentioned through the Section 106 and 110 process really is the public and private sector, it's long-term planning is critical to this entire context. So if Section 110 is done correctly and with extreme weather events in mind, Section 106 actions become inherently more manageable. And where the rubber hits the road on this stuff is that failure to comply with federal regulations on historic preservation, on your installation, 
can result in delays and increased costs associated with them. Uh, state historic preservation officers and tribal historic preservation officers review might add a minimum of two months, even if no significant sites are found or impacted much longer if there are significant resources. Um, actually, I need to go back on the slide, please. Thank you. So some on-base examples of integrating cultural resources within site-specific broader base mission planning. Uh, Goddard Space Center and Johnson Space Center and Langley NASA installation have all taken a very active role in documenting their, and surveying their historic resources on those installations. Andrews Air Force Base, Prince George's County, Maryland, and one of the most densely populated uh, counties in the country and also contains two 18th century resources on its installation. Um, and they worked with local government, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission and the State of Maryland Historic, uh, Maryland Historic Trust to assure the continued preservation of those uh, items or there's uh, pieces of their installation that are historic and on the National Register. And then you can look to the service academies as well. Uh, West Point, Annapolis, United States Air Force Academy, Kings Point, uh, all of those installations are pres facing pressure from urban and suburban development and climate change, extreme weather events. So part of integrating DOD installations and buildings into the broader community is demonstrating how you can build res resilience within that community. And as bases and installations are part of the broader community in which they are located, their building stock and inventory joins that community of architecture across the United States. Resilience defined as the capacity to withstand change or recover from unexpected impacts quickly. Now we're all dealing with a little bit of that right now, but for you military folks, this is not only applicable, but it's inherent in the approach of, of what you do. This is what you guys are the pros to begin with. Um, and, and I think that resilience, community resilience can be actively applied to DOD missions. Uh, we're seeing that already at Tyndall Air Force Base. Again, resilience in its design phase, the installation of the future, they're calling it. Um, and among the historic buildings and cultural resources impacted during Hurricane Irma, the, the preservation of African American cemeteries on the site uh, at Tyndall Air Force Base is a nationally important story. Um, here in Texas, the Environmental Division and award-winning cultural resource program at Fort Bliss has produced integrated cultural resource management plans across two states in an arid uh, environment that is challenging in terms of its uh, location. And we continue to see resilience at Tyndall and Camp Lejeune ongoing. And for, uh, off at Air Force Base, get really, uh, and all the branches of armed forces see a foundation to successfully engage this problem. Uh, in the face of new and challenging external circumstances. And you can see some of the points that, you know, what more can we do here? So we've outlined what we know and what we're doing, and what about the future? The first critical step is really the survey and inventory documentation and determination of purpose for that building. Um, I'm sure most of you are doing that already. And then uh, using tools, technology like ArcGIS, they're developing mapping showing the impact of severe storms and sea rise on US military institution, installations right now. And really, you know, this is really about the broader focus of environmental management on these bases and alignment of cultural, historic, natural, and military resources. And this represents really a shift from reactive to proactive. And, uh, you know, you're kind of getting ahead of the curve here in terms of planning and adaptive reuse and an alignment with a greener approach. Uh, and, I think what this projects also is a sense of balance, balance on base. Um, you know, we're well aware of the Army, all the armed forces need land for mission critical unit training. They need it for weapons ranges, space for educational facilities. And the examples of things like uh, the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California, and the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk, um, those are really unique facilities, as is the Fallon Range in Nevada in the heart of the Great Basin. Um, and really demonstrating that military readiness and stewardship could be complementary, I think is an important piece of this. Uh, and in February 2020, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations and Environment, Todd Millen, 
and reps from Army and Air Force testified before the House Armed Services Committee subcommittee on readiness about military readiness at land-based ranges and the need to maintain natural and cultural resources. And Mr. Mellon uh, did mention the need for unique land-based ranges, but also the need to demonstrate resilience and integration of cultural and natural resources into the planning aspects of those installations. So for example, uh, the Department of the Navy protects cultural resources by developing integrated CRM plans in partnerships with SHPOs and, and tribal SHPOs across the country. The Department of Navy safeguards many of its cultural sites, over 15,000 archaeological sites and 20,000 historic structures. So this is a huge responsibility of stewardship on base. I know most Navy folks are probably not necessarily keen on taking their cues from the Army, but we might again look to the example of Fort Eustis in Virginia where the base's cultural resource management program implemented a study that affects the shoreline erosion on 31 archaeological site, sites on that fort. And goals of the study were to provide an evaluation of current and long-term threats to the archaeological sites, as well as providing a variety of management op options that base planners could implement to protect or mitigate from these threats. And again, what we're really talking about is the proactive management of your installation and base resources. Um, and with more proactive planning, the effects of global climate change and impact of cultural, on cultural heritage can be reduced, if not eliminated entirely. Uh, and with climate change threatening sites across the globe, uh, the armed forces can obviously lead steps to manage and mitigate efforts of cultural and historic resources. And uh, the impact assessment has a role and responsibility in the process that we all engage together. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Mason. Uh, right. So, you know, there's a lot to cover and the the trick on this is that there are so many different resources out there that are going to be helpful and it's it's really difficult to cover a topic that is so broad and has so many nuances that are to a specific to a given region. And so we, th but there, the trick is and, and the help is that there are lots and lots of resources out there to help you get started uh, on this process. And so we threw together a few of the examples of what might be very helpful. And um, actually in the chat window, there are links to all of those that are listed here. Um, one of the resources that I part particularly found very useful was this on the bottom left, that Cultural Resources Climate Change Strategy Guide from the National Park Service. That includes a great reference of all the different types of environmental effects and what that might pose for different types of cultural resources, everything from uh, increased uh, thawing from, you know, loss of permafrost to uh, wildfires to uh, erosion, anything and everything that you can think of that, that has some sort of tie to potential climate impacts is included uh, in this guide. And I found it to be really, really helpful, but there are also other resources as well. And so I would encourage you to look at that chat window and copy down some of those links as they might be very helpful. And of course, uh, you can also contact your branch's historic preservation office and they should have uh, plenty of guidance as well, specific to your range or your uh, installation itself. And I think, you know, we wanted to kind of cover one example of one such resource that's available for you to, to use and reference. And so what we brought, we've got uh, uh, Mickey here, who's going to be talking about uh, NOAA's Digital Coast Platform uh, as one such tool that might be helpful for you. So take it away, Mickey. All right, well, thank you, Mason, and hello, everyone. I uh, really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk with you all about the digital coast. As, as Mason just closed with, there, there are various and, and many resources available to you as you study and assess your risks and vulnerabilities and, and establish resilience plans. Um, the digital coast is one of those resources. Um, and you may not be aware of it. It's outside, you know, civilian community. So um, I 
I appreciate the opportunity to briefly share with you some of the highlights that the Digital Coast has to offer. And can we advance the slides, please? So there we go. All right, so just briefly, uh, the Office for Coastal Management uh, resides within NOAA's National Ocean Service. Um, Time to go into all the details about NOAA, but just uh, I'm assuming you've heard at least of NOAA. Um, our mission within the Office for Coastal Management is to catalyze and inform a broad base of leaders and coastal practitioners to make effective decisions that advance the health and economic prosperity of the coast. Uh, similar probably to some of your missions, their coastal management is about informed decision making. And this decision making has to balance three important goals. Uh, the first of which is keeping people safe and secure. The second is sustain environmental health. And the third is about nurturing the coastal economy. And our office has been in existence for almost 30 years, providing uh, services and products and services to the coastal community. Um, and the Digital Coast has evolved to be that delivery mechanism for our products and services. So folks that we support ask questions like this, and this is what they come to the Digital Coast to, to uh, find information about. For example, how many people live in their floodplains? They'd like to find out information about the vulnerability of those people to, to coastal flooding. How many jobs are supported by the ocean? And what is that economic impact? What are the impacts of coastal storms and sea level rise to my community? Where can I find that data? Where can I find a high resolution LIDAR and other data for my, my state, my county, my, my district, uh, my community? How is that landscape changing over time? We have uh, resources every five years. We map land cover uh, around the country. Um, and then where can I find the training and other learning resources to address the issues I'm trying to address? So this is just a sample of some of the, the information and the types of questions that can be answered by uh, entering into the Digital Coast. Um, the Digital Coast is an enabling platform to lead to better decision making. Uh, you see the tagline here, uh, more than just data. When we envisioned the Digital Coast about 15 years ago, uh, there were many disparate data sources out there. Um, Mason just described there's so many, so many resources now. Um, but what is still the niche that we're still filling is taking those data integrating those into visualization tools, demonstrating how those are applied, and teaching people how to use it all in one place. And that's what the Digital Coast does. And by the partnerships we form, uh, we know it's, it's cons the content is all constituent driven, and it's being used. And we, we track all of that for sure. Um, so most folks know the Digital Coast uh, by our web presence, but it's important to note that Digital Coast is, is more than just a website. It's also a partnership, which I'll touch on at the end. Um, but the enabling platform is built on the interaction between our partners, the users, and the website. And that, all, that connection is critical to the success uh, we've been able to achieve. The philosophy behind it is providing information in a continuum from data out to uh, turning that data into information and resulting in action on the ground. And we also uh, design the, the resources on the digital coast to facilitate access by various levels of users, uh, all the way from the highly technical scientific uh, geospatial analyst to a local elected official and everyone in between. So if, if someone wants to just uh, find out where data are or even download those and map them themselves, they can come into certain parts of the website. Or if they want to do the mapping online and analyze the data online, they can do that as well. And then there's opportunities to learn and then share the results throughout the community. All the information is free and, and publicly accessible, no login required. And any data collected by taxpayer dollars is made freely accessible to the public. So in a nutshell, by the numbers, uh, the web website is broken up into several sections, data being a prime, prime component. We have lots of data available. And we focus, uh, based on our partners, on, on data that on the, our, our investments are focused on three primary data sets that we house within our office. 
uh, high resolution LIDAR data is the number one data set most folks want when addressing resilience issues. That land cover change data I mentioned and high resolution photography. But we also link to uh, over 40 other national data sets. Um, we don't want to duplicate effort. We want to uh, provide information and access to data, but we do not want to duplicate. We, we focus on the data, uh, the LIDAR data for sure, uh, and land cover and imagery, but there are many other data sets accessible through the digital coast that you don't have to go sh shopping for everywhere else. You can just have direct links from our website. So you have all the data, but then you have the, the tools available as well. And these are selective, uh, highly vetted tool, tool inventory applicable to address primary coastal issues. Uh, we hear over and over again from our practitioners, there are too many tools out there. So we spend a lot of time and only, only um, highlighting those that are most used and most needed in, for the community. And it's one thing to have uh, the data and the tools. Uh, there are a lot of folks that don't that need help in applying all those resources. And so we have a, a robust uh, Digital Coast Academy providing almost 200 now learning resources to help facilitate the use of the resources on the Digital Coast. And lastly, that share function, stories from the field is what we call them, uh, use case or case studies from around the country. Uh, it's all 34 uh, states and coastal states and territories, which of course includes the Great Lakes. All right. So I'll step through a couple of examples of some of the, the tools and resources that are available. Uh, one of the most popular and been mentioned here several times already is a sea level rise and the viewer that we created over a decade ago. Uh, we created this um, with working with HUD actually was the an initial uh, development. But it's one of the more popular tools that allows communities to visualize the potential impact of sea level rise. Uh, and we recently updated it uh, to include the latest NOAA projections on sea level rise. So the slider bar on the left side, you can adjust from zero to 10 feet, and then you can do by year and projection level of intermediate, low to high projections. I'm assuming most folks have seen the projection curves out of the National Climate Assessment and they're quite varied. And this, this tool enables communities to visualize that potential impact. Uh, this is an image of Char the peninsula in Charleston, South Carolina, and the, the darker blues, the deeper the water, and the lighter blues coming on land, as you can see. There's also added functionality in this tool to understand the confidence of the mapping that was done. Also, uh, looking at marsh migration, if you have um, environmental concerns of where will the marsh marshes go uh, on sea level rise it enables you to do that as well as looking at the nuisance flooding the high tide flooding that is occurring around the country and the frequency of those as uh, Norfolk was mentioned earlier I think anybody from there is very familiar with the term nuisance flooding and then we also integrate socioeconomic data into the tool. A similar resource that was developed out of Hurricane Sandy and NOAA working with the Corps of Engineers and FEMA developed this coastal flood exposure mapper, which brings in additional hazard layers, uh, combining sea level rise to storm surge levels from various categories, storms, for example, and the ability to overlay uh, societal uh, information and um, risk and environmental exposure, and then create maps on the fly. The Sea Level Rise Viewer enables you to visualize. Uh, this tool enables you to create maps and share those digitally uh, in real time. A recent tool we just developed is around stormwater. Uh, I assume you, many of you deal with stormwater management. This is a, a tutorial type tool that steps the community through the ability to create stormwater management plans depending on the local community thresholds for impacts of high water and, and storm, uh, storm water flooding. And it's a, it's a guidebook and also uh, linkages to funding sources to enable uh, communities to develop their own stormwater management systems and plans. The last tool to show is, is on the surface, probably the most simplistic. And it's a simple, simple resource we call the Coastal County Snapshot. Three of these, uh, and mainly in, in cooperation with one of our key partners, which are the National Association of Counties, who represent the 3,000 uh, counties around the country and all the elected officials uh, within them. And so the first on the left is a flood exposure snapshot for the 
Lee County, Florida, as an example. And what you see here, and I know you can't read the text, um, but the, the pie charts are in light, the light blue are the amount of people in, in Lee County that live in a FEMA flood zone. And, and then those that, and those vulnerable populations of populations over 65 and in poverty. It enables an elected official to understand the risk of their local community. Uh, community's population to flooding. And then the bar graph below that shows the same kind of color coding for critical infrastructure, schools, police departments, uh, fire stations. Um, and then the, the last pie chart is around developable land and, and land being developed in FEMA flood zones. So it gives a really good picture, short snapshot of a community's exposure to, to flooding. Um, the middle one is uh, an ocean economy snapshot and where we have lots of data on the impact uh, that ocean resources have on a local community's um, like economy through six sectors, economic sectors. We map that for every coastal county. And then a wetlands benefits snapshot as well, showing the benefits of wetlands around the nation. So this is a, a quick tool on the front page is what you see here. On the back is information on how folks can find out where all these data are, access those data, and take next steps in examining these situations for their locale. Low, low uh, Digital Coast Academy, I mentioned earlier, lots of learning, learning resources from uh, instructor-led trainings to self-guided resources, case studies, and webinars. Um, this is probably the part of Digital Coast that's most extensible to other parts of the country and not being not just coastal states and territories. No, there are many resources like a risk communication uh, training course that we have that, admit, that teach uh, folks to uh, ways to communicate with their local groups, communities on, on, on ways to gain um, communication tricks to help folks understand their risk and appreciate the risk that flooding and sea level rise bring to, to their communities. And lastly, as a stories from the field, I mentioned earlier, this is people sharing resources from around the country of how, or sharing case studies of how they're applying these resources to address their particular issues. A couple of those, just as examples, for example, Tybee Island, Georgia, uh, they use the resources, the date, LIDAR data, and the Sea Level Rise Viewer to uh, adopt a new uh, climate adaptation plan. Uh, they realized that sea levels were rising and the causeway out to their island would become flooded if they didn't do something about it, as well as protecting their dune structure to absorb the impact of coastal storms. Uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts used their economic data to really tailor their maritime economy profile and explore new emerging markets to improve their um, socioeconomic plans for their community. And then lastly, a, another community on the Gulf Coast using resources to change their plans from hardened shorelines to using green infrastructure and a living shoreline. That's just several quick case studies of how folks around the country are using these resources to address their issues. And lastly, I just wanted to mention the partnership. This is critical to success. Is under we we work very closely with these national associations that represent hundreds of thousands of people around the country. American Planning Association, you're probably familiar with, state floodplain managers, um, the National Association of Counties I mentioned, National State Geographic Information Camp. These are your geospatial reps to the governor's offices in every state. Uh, the Urban Land Institute, their members are with the developers and the real estate reinsurers of, of the nation. And they provide input to uh, the content of what we put into the Digital Coast and developing our strategic path forward. So I'll offer this as just an example, another resource. Uh, there are many ways to connect with the Digital Coast uh, listed here. Uh, my email is there as well. Connect us through social media and invite you to get our monthly newsletter updates um, anytime uh, you'd like. So please, I, again, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to join you here today uh, and look forward to discussing these resources further. So Judy, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mickey. And thank you, Robert and Mason. That was a great presentation on the cultural resource 
preservation in the face of climate change. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, um, realizing that the time is running a bit short. Um, there was one that popped up in the text box with uh, Ms. Eldridge, and I saw that there was some dialogue going back and forth. Um, uh, Mason, regarding, you know, do you recommend proactively excavating subsurface sites that are in danger of coastal erosion? Uh, and any recent examples um, from the military perspective? Uh, Mason, you asked to, to chime in a little bit, so go right ahead. Yeah, I was, um, the, yeah, the question was, was specific to that about proactively excavating these resources. And, and I think, um, Robert and Scott provided some great answers on that, and I do I cannot cite any specific examples of uh, proactive excavations that have been conducted. I think um, there is a, a nuance to this that is a bit of a makes it a bit tricky. Everybody loves the "it depends" answer, um, and I think that um, I wanted to bring that up because you know ultimately, as yeah. cultural resource managers and as archaeologists. Um, it might sound kind of counterintuitive, but ideally we would never dig up any archaeological sites because as soon as we dig up a site, then that site is essentially destroyed, or at least that part of that site is destroyed forever. We can recover the information that comes out of it, uh, which is incredibly useful, but the best archaeological site is one that's left alone. Um, and so you have to really, and that's where it comes into, I think it, it speaks to Scott and um, Robert's guidance that it really does, it's very important to inventory these resources and monitor them uh, over time because you can start to identify whether we, we, you've reached a, a point of no return where this specific site is definitely going to uh, subside and go uh, into the water at some point soon and therefore the best option is to at least preserve the data that comes from it versus um, getting w too far ahead of yourself and then you're excavating sites. Not only is it just the the loss of the site itself, but the costs that go with that excavation that may ultimately not be necessary for, for one reason or another. And so it really does, I think there is a, a preservation uh, initiative behind archaeology that in some instances people don't quite uh, understand that you know it just that it sounds so strange but yeah we would prefer that sites are left alone as much as possible and so um, always put that in the back of your mind if you're looking at some of these resources to make sure that this is indeed a resource that is going to be lost for sure and then making those steps to proactively uh, recover the data that's there that could be a, a, a good solution and so that was kind of the addition I was going to add to their conversation Okay, great. Thanks very much, Mason. Um, another one or two questions, uh, very quickly, because uh, Rick does need to give some updates for the SMA, SAME to the team. But um, for you, Robert, uh, with COVID-19 recently being declared a federal disaster, is there any impact at all to cultural or historic resources? Well, this is something we've had a chance to talk about a, a little bit in the last week. Um, we've seen calls for architectural historians uh, as part of COVID-19 response, um, and that's presumably through contractors to FEMA. But I think that uh, there is going to be a dem demonstrable impact to historic sites, particularly those obviously in the medical and science medical science realm. Um, you know, if you were to expand, uh, not to be grim, but cemetery spaces, or um, you know, if there were no survey there previously or the, any alterations to hospitals that need to be made in the future, and really proactive uh, planning for uh, really the, uh, the, the, the wave that caught us kind of off guard now, I think is, in terms of a DOD perspective, uh, I'll let somebody inside DOD take that, but uh, I think that there will be an impact in the future. Great, thanks very much. Um, with the balance of the time left, uh, I will turn it over to Rick Cox. Uh, Rick, I believe you're going to give some updates from SAME. So over to you. All right. Thanks. Waiting for Tamil to get the slides or transfer control here. Oh, good. I got controls.
Oops, sorry. Okay, first off, uh, give you a couple of update items. You may have seen the notice that uh, SME has canceled JETC. It, I know that was a difficult decision. You know, it was supposed to be our centennial celebration and they had a tremendous amount of planning that had been done for the last year and a half to two years. They are looking at trying to make the JETC educational presentations virtual or whatever. So uh, keep monitoring SAME and the newsletters and such. Sometimes these things get lost in your inbox. The other thing is uh, you won't hurt my feelings if you want to drop off. You got to get off to some uh, something else because you will get these slides. And they are also located on uh, SAME's Cap Week website. Um, and so if you go and search and you can find them in there. But I thought I'd give, kind of give you an update on some changes and such as I've been doing this for a few years and I kind of watch all of this. First off, Laura Beasley has uh, taken over for Karen Baker who's moved up. Uh, Laura, that announcement came at Small Business Conference and do encourage you to, if you get a chance to meet her, she's very personable and she'd be happy to talk to you about anything. She's a very friendly person, very approachable. So uh, you all have seen these slides for a couple of years. I am gonna pause on a couple of key slides because I know if I were in your shoes, I would wanna do a screenshot. So feel free to take a screenshot and I'll tell you which ones that I would do. So. Uh, pretty much the same workload. I'm sure this slide has changed significantly in light of COVID and, and the diversion of funding and resource to, to battle that. So, um, but that was a, a month ago what this, you know, the projections looked like. So I'm sure there's gonna be significant uh, alterations there. So this is a slide that usually people, you know, contractors, we wanna know how they're gonna spend the money. So this is the FY20 MMRP uh, plan. And um, as you see the, the shift from IR to MR is still continuing. They haven't crossed the, the curves yet. So hopefully you had enough time to get a screenshot on this one. And then what's new? Well, very frankly, this isn't necessarily new. We, we've known for a couple of years that the Corps is going to be executing uh, the, Ar the Air Force's environmental restoration program. You know, Tulsa, Mobile, Omaha have been uh, supporting them for years. And then uh, PFAS, PFOA, PFOS, that they've been um, plussed up and given additional funding to address this. <clears throat> So a uh, screenshot moment, the, these are the points of contact. These are all uh, great people, uh, Chris Evans, Antonia, Laura, and Anisha. So some, you know, know many of you know these people already, but uh, they are very um, impressive professionals. And so feel free to reach out to them. Although keep in mind that right now they're probably busy with COVID and all the response efforts going on there. Next up is gonna be Navy, and Rob Sedora heads up this program. <clears throat> and you've seen this slide a few dozen times already, so I'm gonna skip through some of these. These are the same slides that they've given for several years uh, in terms of what they're addressing. And, and one of the things that, in conversations with Rob Sedora, you know, the risk communications associated with this is also important. Vapor intrusion is another item that they continue to face and address as well. So the budget remains fairly level here. Uh, you know, the, the PFAS before plus ups is obviously gonna help the Navy. Bear with me a second while the slide advances. So the execute this. So here's the program. It looks about the same as, as before. They are buying down the IR program. And in the next slide, we'll kind of articulate this a little bit better. But uh, if you, you want to take a screenshot, do it right now. So 
So this is an interesting slide. And, and those of us who have been paying attention to the IR and MR program for a long time, you know, have been waiting for these programs to cross lines, I, you know, meaning that the MR program would exceed the IR program in terms of budget. And, that, and I'm, I can go back many years and, and those lines should have crossed, were supposed to cross about three or four years ago and they haven't, as we know, it's gonna keep slipping to the right. But one of the questions that I asked Rob Sedora last year was this, you know, since we're, we're spending so much money to address the IR liability and to get these sites cleaned up, why isn't, you know, that going down? And Rob's answer was very enlightening to me. He goes, well, the budget that they get is not enough to cover the inflation that they face. And that's an interesting point because the Navy, more than the rest takes an environmental liability approach where they quantify in dollar terms every component of their program and they do a, a very rigorous drill of mid-year and end of year revalidation and the fact that you know the escalation associated with inflation uh, is more than what they they're budgeted for so you keep that in mind is is in, in my perspective is job security as a contractor, you know, when are we going to clean everything up? But rest assured that uh, we have great job security here, but both because of new contaminations, inflation, uh, et cetera. So, so there's the uh, funding profiles that you can see MR continues to ramp up and we've seen these uh, as they move the IR program towards uh, the right side being site uh, close out and such, you know, the investigation's already been done, and then a greater shift towards the MR program and, and getting those characterized. So uh, we all pay attention to this. Um, you know, small business goals and NAFBAG does carry a heavy load here. You can see 43%, which keeps uh, increasing here. And if you go to this link, Trust me, it's not going to help. It, they haven't updated that link in about a year and a half now in terms of what their forecast looks. But this next, uh, before I get to the next slide, the majority of the funding in the third quarter, we always see that where they're spending a whole lot of money real fast and, and you need to have the contracts. And uh, they talk about the low utilization rates of MACs. However, you know, from my experience, uh, contract officers don't like MACs because they increase the workload burden, but you'll see in a minute who does use them. Uh, there's a capacity. Showing where they're spending the most of the money. And this is the important slide here. So this is the screenshot slide. You can see the claims are being recompeted. When you look at the multiple award, you'll see that NAFAC Southwest and in, in, in NAFAC Pacific are the ones that are using that. Um, well, Midland does have one for an RIO remedial action optimization. And I think we know that to be a, a small business one, but um, claims are increasing in dollars. So teaming is important, unrestricted. You know, we know that the strength of incumbency. So uh, heads up, uh, take a look at this. Uh, tap at the bottom, tap three, if it is tapes, I don't know if that tap. oh, tap, there's another tap. So, okay. Okay, SME Capital Week for Air Force, Judy Lopez is gonna represent uh, Colonel Campbell. Um, and I'll jump through it. You all have seen these, this slide before a few times. And I took a look. This is pretty much what well, is the same slide as last year. No change there. They were showing uh, $217 million last year for FY19. They haven't done a FY20 update there. And I do have a slide on the fence to fence and what the competition strategy is, which is this one right here. So screenshot moment. 
So the BPAs that they'll be competing as we've seen on, on GSA, Small Business Awards. I think we know most of these contractors are doing this. You know, the screenshot moment, FY 21 to 24. And, and the Air Force does a great job of doing this forecast. So you may have seen this last year and there might be minor tweaks here and there. Moving restoration. I think we all quite familiar with the ORC plan of, of AFCAC. Finishing off the PBRs. I think the some contractors are probably happy about that. And and this is what we saw last year as well, moving to the ORC from the PBRs. Uh, they've had multiple industry days. I don't know if they've had any this year. So some of you may be better for, informed than I am. Well, it looks like three March. Hmm. Okay. Okay, wrapping up this, I think we're about at the end, folks. If you're paying attention to ORCs and, and you're a big contractor or you're focused on remediation, this may be a good slide for you to take a screenshot of. We've seen this before. And as I page through these folks, uh, feel free to reach out. You know, Rick Weiss is taking over as chair of the Environmental COI in May with the JTC. And um, I'll support him on this. This is your committee. I'm glad that we could pull off this presentation. I'm glad we could get more industry participation. That's what been my it's been my emphasis here to get everybody to have a recognition of professionalism. We're not just a restoration. We're not just a range. Uh, as we saw from today's presentation, uh, we do want to represent the entire environmental industry. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, appreciate it very much and be safe. And we'll catch you at the monthly meeting. Thanks, Bill. Hi folks, so anyone that's still on, um, this is Belle from SAME. Just to update, if you haven't heard the news already, that unfortunately uh, 2020 JTC is not going to be done as originally planned. We are going to look <clears throat> at options for a virtual conference to at least highlight the educational portion of the conference. We are here to support you if you need us in any way please reach out. We are here. We are still willing to fight the fight. So facilities management workshop, July 29-31. Let's see. Who knows? Is it going to be live? Is it going to be virtual? And the 2020 Small Business Conference, hopefully this will become a mega conference and will add aspects of the JTC planning to that conference. With that said, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanking our speakers, thanking our moderator. Thanks, Rick. What a great job you do for the Environmental Committee. We will be posting on the Environmental website the recording for today. And also to Mel, who has been behind the scenes working the slides. Thank you so much, to Mel. We'll be sending out an email with the presentation and also the PDH certificate for you to enjoy with those useful links that were issued today. So with that said, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy and have a wonderful day.